All right, hi guys, we're back in module three and we're gonna be taking a look at example 3.2. It's on page 80 in your textbook and it has to do with the law of definite proportion. So let's review what that definition is. The law of definite proportion says that the proportion of elements in any compound is always the same, definitely. Hence, definite proportions. Example 3.2 on page 80 says, a chemist reacts 15.0 grams of calcium with 15.0 grams of oxygen. This reaction makes 21.0 grams of a known compound, lime. Along with the lime, there's also some leftover oxygen. If the chemist wants to make 55 grams of lime and have no leftover oxygen or calcium, how much of each element should he use? All right, so to solve this problem, first we need to know exactly how much oxygen is used because it says there was some that was left over. Okay, so we are in example 3.2 and we know that 15.0 grams of calcium was added to 15.0 grams of oxygen to give 21.0 0 grams of lime and a certain amount of leftover oxygen. All right, so the question is how much leftover oxygen was there? Well, if you remember from the law of conservation of matter, the mass before the reaction and after the reaction has to be equal. We cannot create or destroy matter. So if it equals 30 grams over here, we must end up with 30 grams over here. 30.0 grams minus the 21.0 grams that we know is lime is gonna tell us how much leftover oxygen we have. The answer then is 9.0 grams. And because we are subtracting, then we look at the measurement that is the least precise and that is how precise our answer should be with regard to sig figs. So we have an answer in the 10th decimal place, 10th. So nine grams of oxygen was left over, which means six grams of oxygen was used because we started with 15, right? 15.0 grams minus 9.0 grams left over gives us 6.0 grams of oxygen actually used. So the recipe for making lime would be 15, 0.0 grams of calcium plus uh, whoops, 6 point zero grams of oxygen and that equals 21.0 grams of lime. Now our question says how much calcium and how much ox oxygen is needed to make 55 grams of lime. So in the end, now we want 55 grams of lime, okay? So just like with a recipe, if we wanted to make not one cake recipe, but we wanted to make three cakes for that special chemistry teacher in our life, then we would multiply one times a factor of three to get three cake mixes, for example, okay? And if we multiply this number times three, then we have to multiply each of the ingredients times three, okay? But we can see that three is not the magic number, it's not the factor that we need to multiply 21 by to get 55. So we have to figure out just what is that number right there that we're gonna be multiplying everything by. Uh, so we're wondering 21.0 grams times, let's call it x, times what will equal 55 grams? What is that number that we're gonna be multiplying by? So we divide both sides by 21.0 grams. The units cancel out so our answer is actually not gonna have any units. Your book tells you it's called a dimensionless quantity because it's just a number this time. Okay, so X equals, type it into your handy dandy calculator, 55 
divided by 21, I would, but my calculator is my phone, which is recording me at the moment. So 55 divided by 21, I know is 2.6. So if we multiply the lime times 2.6, you multiply, excuse me, 21 grams of lime by 2.6, we end up with the desired amount of lime, 55 grams of lime. If we multiply six grams of oxygen by that same number, 6.0 grams of oxygen times 2.6, we come up with how much oxygen we need to produce 55 grams of lime, which is 16 grams of oxygen. Now we can only have two significant figures because our number 2.6 only has two points two significant figures. Okay, and then for calcium, instead of needing 15, 15 grams of calcium, we multiply it by our factor of 2.6, and we end up with uh, 39 grams of oxygen. So in other words, if you have 16 grams of oxygen and react it with 39 grams of calcium, you can create 55 grams of lime, which is what the, the question was asking. Okay, so that's example 3.2. And we're gonna flip the page now, and on page 82, we're gonna take a few notes on another law, the law of multiple proportions. Instead of the law of definite proportions, this is the law of multiple proportions. So hopefully you're understanding that in a problem like this, if you think of it as a recipe and realize that however many um, of your products you want to end up with, you have to multiply um, by a certain factor and then you use that same number to multiply each of the ingredients by it to figure out how many ingredients. So we keep the proportion of each of the ingredients the same for creating that one compound, okay? So that was in the law of definite proportions. We're dealing with one compound there. In the law of multiple proportions, we are talking about two elements combining to form two different compounds, depending on how they are, um, in, what, in what proportion they're combined. So this is the law of multiple proportions. And it states, if two elements combine, if two elements combine to form different compounds, if two elements combine to form different compounds, the ratio of masses, the ratio of masses of the second element that react with that react with a fixed mass of the first element will be a simple whole number ratio will be a simple whole number, this doesn't sound very simple, does it? Ratio. All right, what in the hey see does that mean, right? Well, let's break it down, okay? I will give you an example, which will hopefully help you to understand it better. If two elements combine to form different compounds, okay? So let's say we have carbon 
and we have oxygen. And if we react 12 grams of carbon with 32 grams of oxygen, got to make sure that looks like an O, we will create carbon dioxide, 44.0 grams of it. Okay, carbon dioxide, not toxic, right? We exhale it out every time that we take a breath and exhale, out comes carbon dioxide. However, if you take these same two elements, carbon and oxygen, and say this time we keep the 12 grams of carbon, but this time we react it with less oxygen. We react it with only 16 grams of oxygen, okay? We will create something much, much different. Carbon monoxide, which is toxic. In fact, if you inhale it and breathe in too much of it, you will die. So something very different. And this time we've created, let's see, 28 grams of carbon monoxide. So let's read through the law again and see how this works. If two elements, carbon and oxygen, combine to form different compounds, okay, so in this example, you can combine them in different ways and end up with two different compounds, the ratio of masses of the second element, okay, so we're looking at the masses of the oxygen, the oxygen is the one that we're calling the second element this time, that ratio of masses, when it is reacted with a fixed mass of the first element, you'll see that for the first element, carbon, we kept it at the same amount, 12 grams. So when it is reacted with a fixed mass of the first element, the ratio of the mass of the second element will be a simple whole number ratio. So let's see what that ratio is, because we do in fact have a fixed mass for the carbon for both reactions, okay, it was 12 for the first reaction, it's 12 for the second reaction. Um, but for the second element, oxygen, our ratio would be 32.0 grams to 16.0 grams. Can that be reduced? Yes, it can. 32 to 16 is the same as 2 to 1, which is a simple whole number ratio. So that is what the law of multiple proportions is. And there's another example in your book and a problem that you can work out and on your own problem. What you need to remember about this is that this is, this law was very important because it was the main evidence used this a minute. Okay, good enough. Good enough for now. This law was the main evidence for John Dalton's atomic theory which we will take notes on next time, okay? So this is our actual modern understanding of atoms. We got it from John Dalton, and he used this law to prove it because it's hard to prove something with atoms, right? Because they're so tiny. There's no microscope in the world that can actually look and see what atoms are doing. But by using this law, he proved it, and we still understand atoms according to his atomic theory today.